Number five, SCP-1128. Number five on our list, 1128, is a terrifying entity that manifests itself as a colossal aquatic predator. It's sometimes described as a being similar to a shark, only in a more grotesque and twisted appearance, with common descriptions across all sightings being a mouth full of teeth. The entity manifests itself as an aquatic predator to anyone who is given a full description of the beast's appearance, either through a written description or a spoken description, so... Sorry. Sorry for describing it. Few surviving subjects have described it as resembling a massive monstrous deformed shark. Once a subject is exposed to detailed knowledge of 1128, they become infected by its latent psychic ability, forming a connection. From here, no immediate abnormal changes in behavior or occurrences are present, with the only notable variance being a hesitation to enter bodies of water, for good reason, too. Once an exposed subject submerges themselves completely in water, they are caught by 1128. Any submerged water is enough. Subjects are taken mysteriously to an ocean, the location of which is redacted by the Foundation. From here, you are hunted by SCP-1128. The Foundation patrols this unmarked ocean in a desperate attempt to contain the creature and protect anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in its trap. It's difficult to interview subjects after an exposure, as any detailed description of the encounter does run the risk of contaminating more Foundation members. Should a member or subject become infected by SCP-1128, treatment is immediately advised, with Class C amnesiacs being used to try and block memory of the entity. So, maybe for your sake and my sake, try to to forget number five entirely for your own safety. Now the foundation does advise that if you've been enjoying the content that we produce, you should toss a subscribe our way. Number four, SCP-1451. SCP-1451 is an odd one even by foundation standards. SCP-1451 presents itself as a set of 26 metal statues at the bottom of the ocean. All appear to be statues of children of varying heights. The statues are all standing in a circle, holding each other's hands and facing outwards in a ring formation. Should any object, living or otherwise, with a mask greater than 40 gram enter into the ring, SCP-1451 begins to animate. The statues will shift themselves in a counterclockwise movement. Their hands will raise and lower slightly, and bubbles can be seen protruding from their mouths. Once it becomes fully animated, SCP-1451 displays advanced strength and tactics, being reported to use various martial arts to dispatch targets, pressure point application on humans, and precise strikes on machinery. They move in perfect unison and coordination, with some speculation that they operate on some level of hive mind mentality across the 26 individual entities. Once SCP-1451 has begun its hunt, it will not rest until it is disposed of whatever invaded its territory. The Foundation refers to three states of SCP-1451. Class 1 is the initial ring of statues in its inert state, Class 2 is the slight animation and bubbling seen present, and a Class 3 situation is when an active hunt has begun. To try and prevent a Class 3 situation, the SCP Foundation has installed a sphere of wire mesh netting to ensure nothing too large enters the ring. Natural water currents and oceanic movement aren't to be obstructed. The creature does need to eat sometimes. Number 3, SCP-835. SCP-835 manifests itself as a large cluster of polyps resembling a species of coral, although it's significantly larger than any discovered species of coral. The center mass of the cluster is a very large oval with 3 meter long polyps at each end. SCP-835 does not move, instead anchoring itself to the ocean floor using heaving tentacles that protrude from the polyps. The tentacles are coated in an adhesive substance and have been shown to be incredibly strong, capable of damaging bulkheads and steel. The coral base of SCP-835 is extremely durable and resistant to most attempts to collect any tissue samples, with the Foundation having to use high-powered diamond drill bits to collect even small samples of DNA. SCP-835 emits a large mass of semi-liquid material several times a day from each polyp. The toxic substance appears to be a mixture of digested solids, fecal matters, several bacteria, viruses, and parasites, with many sequences having originated only from 835. So what exactly makes SCP-835 so threatening? Well, sample reports from SCP-835 have shown that it's comprised almost exclusively of human DNA. Its hard shell seems to be recycled tooth enamel, its tentacles matching human flesh. A level 4 clearance declassified document from the Foundation detailed an encounter with an underwater isolation team, in which an incident in which two members of the isolation team were swallowed by SCP-835, pulled in by its tentacles deep underneath what they had initially thought to be a cave, but realized was the contents of SCP-835's stomach. The crew members reported descending deeper and deeper, spending up to 72 hours inside the creature's digestive tract, the insides of its intestines lined with remnants of unfortunate victims, claiming that they had been morphed into flesh and there was a wall of faces crying for release. Eventually, one of the crew members was released, though after significant breaches to its suit, 
Unfortunately, he had to be let go from the foundation. We thank him for his service. Number two, SCP-1092. SCP-1092 presents itself as a class of Astyachthys fish, and when the creature is matured, it resembles any number of other ocean-dwelling fish, with the only notable variance being its increased aggressive behavior, attacking prey. It's difficult for the foundation to study, as only adult specimens can be studied, as in its juvenile phase, SCP-1092 are parasites birthed from a living host. Once SCP-1092 infects the bloodstream of its host, absorbing nutrients directly from the host's blood. Once exposed, the parasites initially are but a few millimeters in most its size, but grow many times their size, with the largest extracted one on record being 2.1 centimeters. There is insufficient data on how SCP-1092 infects its hosts. The current research data theorizes that minuscule eggs makes its way into the body through small cuts and scrapes, which would explain the fish's violent tendencies. Those infected by SCP-1092 report fatigue, weight loss, and increased appetite, and in many cases report a feeling of something fluttering or squirming inside the body. However, this is not present in all cases, as there are reported case files of hosts not experiencing any visible symptoms whatsoever until the parasite has unfortunately matured to its adult aquatic stage. Once the parasites have matured, the now adolescent creature will try to forcibly remove themselves from the physical body of their host, using their sharp teeth to cut through blood vessels and skin. Subjects at this stage will sustain injuries, severe blood loss, and in some cases worse. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation has effectively secured SCP-1092, keeping it housed in a completely watertight cell, where it is given the occasional domestic pig to act as a host for its reproductive cycle. Poor little piggy. Thank you, piggy. Thank you, Foundation. Number 1. SCP-3000 SCP-3000 is one of the most powerful SCPs currently being monitored by the Foundation. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity and is a Level 5 classified document. I really shouldn't even be talking to you about this, but it's good to get this information out there. It is a massive, massive aquatic sea serpent that closely resembles a moray eel, only gigantic. There's been significant difficulty in efforts in trying to document its true size, but it is estimated to be anywhere between 600 and 900 kilometers in length, with its head measuring roughly 2.5 meters wide and its body as large as 10 meters in diameter. SCP-3000, thankfully, is typically a sedentary creature, not moving much at all, usually only responding to feeding. The majority of its body rarely moves. SCP-3000 has been known to be carnivorous, and when it hunts, it has been known to move exceedingly quickly. Fascinatingly, despite its gargantuan size, SCP-3000 does not appear to need sustenance to maintain its body's function, and thus its digestive process is unknown. Although complicating matters slightly is a process wherein SCP-3000 disperses a thin layer of viscous dark gray sludge through its skin whilst it consumes its prey. It doesn't stop there though. SCP-3000 has been recognized to cause severe mental damage in those who research it. Direct observation and study has been proven to cause mental alteration in Foundation researchers, experiencing paranoia, fear, anxiety, memory loss, and most worryingly, inexplicable severe headaches. It's unknown how SCP-3000 causes this, but the theories are that it has a latent psychic ability. There are some who believe SCP-3000 could be an old god that has found its way into our world. The creature is too immense to be contained in any Foundation facility, instead being kept in a clandestine area of the Bay of Bengal, in an area barred from the public, routinely patrolled and surrounded by Foundation vessels. Be extremely thankful that the brave members of the Foundation are researching and containing this. Secure, contain, protect. Those are the goals of the Foundation. Number five, the Lurlian Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10 story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10 story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I I grew up on the Disney version, and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it, and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? 
I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra would regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, two more. Another two are growing. Yeah, good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, aka Huge Monster, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the world serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, Roid Rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay-per-view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called the Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah, Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg for sure. And also the mind control. I don't know how sharks brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there. Yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred texts now, the Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster, the Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? 
like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils, and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's something like 300 miles long, according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature, told by two different people peoples? Oh, mind blown. Again, the Megalodon, I think, would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the Twilight Zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the King of Kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's disruptive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate, yeah. And it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Number five, the frilled shark. Chlamydoslacus ingenius and Chlamydoslacus africana, or better known as the frilled shark, and the frilled South African shark, are the two extinct species of shark that swam our oceans. Thank gosh, well, actually, still kinda do. Eh. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil. Not just its age and time spent surfing the coast, due to its primitive eel-like physical trait, the brown color, the jaws, eight-foot body, and the way its fins, spine, and head move under the water are common in ancient serpents and water creatures. So this thing is like an eel-serpent-shark hybrid. Yeah, little jarring. Commonly referred to simply as the frilled shark because of its six pairs of gill slits at its throat. It swims amongst the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, usually in deep, dark, murky waters of the outer continental shelf and upper continental slope. These deep dive sharks usually live and sleep near the ocean floor. Okay, that's, that's a good sign, of course. They live on a diet of cephalopods, smaller sharks, and even swim to the surface at night to feed what's floating atop on the surface. When hunting, the frilled shark moves like an eel, bending and slithering to swallow prey with its long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 rows of recurved needle-like teeth. So am I just gonna like snorkel into one of these things any day now? Well, good thing is they're really hard to find. Like, really hard. Usually caught by accident in commercial fishing nets, usually at depths anywhere between 50 and 1,000 meters. So unless you're free diving at night, you should be okay. Yeah, they like it deep and dark. I'd say these things are already scarier than the Meg. It's like a shark, but an eel-snake hybrid with a shark head and shark-size teeth. That sounds a bit scarier. Well, I mean, the Meg preferred warmer, shallower waters, so maybe this one's a tie. I don't know who's snorkeling two miles deep, but it's certainly not me, okay? In my opinion, I'd take a large great white over this dinosaur-looking thing slithering after me any day. Number four, the fang-toothed fish. Ah, yes, the Anoplogaster cornuta, or commonly known as the fang tooth. I wonder why. Though they spend most of their time in the deep, deep, common fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. Sorry, the fang tooths are known to migrate towards the surface at night. That is the scariest sentence I've ever said. Dude, these are way scarier than this giant ancient shark. 
Like all the scariest things come out at night. You notice that? And root canals, but they're usually done during the day. The word megalodon is Greek words meaning giant tooth. I'd take big teeth over this thing chasing me around any day. Thankfully though, this guy is only about a foot in length. Okay, that's not so bad. The fish has a mouth that are full of long snake teeth, perfect for hanging onto its prey as they shake. The lockable jaws ensure that although thrashing may occur, the fang tooth's teeth are locked clamps that effortlessly swim with dinner in its mouth, just getting dragged deeper and deeper down, wiggling and can't move, trying to run for their lives. Well, swim for their lives. And fish of any size. I'm sorry? Yep, any size. Common fang tooths have been recorded at depths of about 5,000 meters, so whatever lives down there, it's game on. Look at this thing. I was scared of sunfish and seaweed brushing up against my legs. This thing swimming by me, this thing, it looks like a night terror in itself, stalking their preferred prey of crustaceans and of course, other fishes the same size. Common fang tooths are more active than many other deep sea fish and seek out food for meal and sport rather than being purely ambush predators eating when they're hungry. That's terrifying. Packing up for the long winter, huh? Their huge mouth and very long teeth ensure that they are able to attack prey and actually hold on while they relocate them to a deeper, darker spot where they can kind of take their time on the meal. I've swam with sharks. In my opinion, this thing's way scarier. Like eating small critters running around the ocean floor, sure. But also imagine eating something the same size of itself with teeth, no problem. Slowly devouring it bite by bite. Yeah, that's way scarier, come on. Just reattaching itself every bite, taking you along for the free ride. Yeah, that's, that's, that's horrifying. And number three, the big fin squid. Of the genus Magnapinidae family, the big fin squid, or as I like to call it, this ocean alien with shoulders, belongs to a group of rarely seen cephalopods with a distinctive morphology, meaning they're really, really weird and rare. Magnapinidae, meaning big fin, of course. The first record of us catching and looking at this family comes from a specimen talismani caught off the Azores in 1907. This was our first look at this bizarre fish, but due to the damaged nature of the find, little information could be extracted and was classified just as a squid. The problem is when you pull these things out of its atmosphere, it just looks like a piece of wet crinoline dress all of a sudden. Don't get the whole terrifying effect, you know? In 1956, a similar squid was caught in the South Atlantic, but during the 80s, two specimens were found in the Atlantic, then three more were found in the Pacific, and eventually the creatures found a place amongst the books as its own species, entering the family Magdapinidae. Squids. Okay, so it's not actually a squid, but loosely related. Like a third cousin of maybe alien origin. This thing looks like it crashed here on an asteroid. I'm just gonna say it, doesn't it? Like there's only 12 of these, not many. The arms and tentacles are the same length. The appendages are also huge and held perpendicular to the body, creating the appearance of a illusion of arms and elbows, giving its trademark alien figure. Most remarkable is the length of the elastic tentacles, which has been estimated around 20 to 30 times its mass and length. Deep sea video evidence puts the total length of the largest specimens at 10 meters long. Yeah, that's two trucks. Close-ups of the body and head show us that the fins are extremely large, being proportionately nearly as big as those of a big fin squid. Hence, the comparison. While they do appear similar, no specimens or samples of the adults have been taken out of the water yet, leaving their exact identity, bodily functions, and internal organs a mystery. Awesome. Yes, more mysteries under the water. All right, I only had uh, really bad night terrors already. Let's just add this in there. Yeah, I'd take a shark swimming with a brain at me rather than this alien thing swimming up to me and just staring at me, trying to understand me for about an hour. Terrifying. Number two, the gulper eel, Eurypharynx pelicanoides. The pelican eel, or what I just said, is basically a deep sea eel, like deep, deep sea. If you've seen the Ridley Scott's alien film franchise or the Predator universe, you'll know that this thing looks exactly like that. Yeah, am I wrong? But instead of like eight feet tall, it's only three feet tall. Yeah, still terrifying. The pelican eel has been described by many synonyms, yet nobody has been able to demonstrate that more than one species of pelican eel exists. Riding solo, huh? That's creepy. One of a kind kind of deal. It's also commonly known as the gulper eel or umbrella mouth gulper eel due to its terrifying size and function of its mouth. The mouth and jaws resemble a pelican's gulp, hence the name. The morphology of the pelican eel can be difficult to describe because they're so fragile and oddly shaped that they become damaged when they're pulled out of the deep sea's immense pressure. We can't just swim all the way down there and take pictures, you know? The pelican eel's most notable feature, its mouth, which is much, much larger than its body, like 
five times the size. The mouth is loosely hinged and can be opened wide enough to swallow a fish three times its size. This thing has like a lower mandible of a python. Just like unhinging it before dinner. The lower jaw is hinged at the base of the head with no body mass behind it, making the head look abysmally huge. It's basically a swimming mouth with a spine, tail, and I think a brain? Yeah, we don't really know yet. With dot-sized eyes, yeah. It usually is always moving too, rarely stationary. It hunts in some sort of folded state. The pelican eel's mouth has the capability to change to an inflated shape when hunting, giving the mouth its notably massive appearance. Dude, the mouth unfolds like the James Webb telescope. Like a hundred working parts. Technically, it's like a geometric shape unfolding as a mouth, followed by stretching, like a cootie catcher. Remember those? This thing eats like a cootie catcher. When the pelican eel is in pursuit of its prey, it slowly starts unfolding itself. Imagine this thing's trucking behind you, unhinging its jaw, slowly the closer it gets. The head and jaw structure unfold and spread horizontally, not vertically. Okay, that's scarier all of a sudden. The unspreading event, or as I like to call it, lunch, is followed by the inflation of the mouth from a stretchable skin of the head, which it feeds on prey. Then, water's expelled via the gills. Okay, so it's basically a large strainer, and after it eats, it blows itself out, releases all the water back into the water. Just wrings itself out. Come on, this thing is horrifying. Thank gosh it only eats crustaceans and creepy little crawlies on the bottom seafloor. And number one, the phantom jellyfish. Stygio medusa gigantea. I love that word. Commonly known as the giant phantom jellyfish, is a part of the monotypic genus of deep sea jellyfish. Stygio medusa. With only around 110 sightings in 110 years, it's a jellyfish that is rarely seen. Well, I guess like once a year. I don't know, I'm not really good at math. Believed to be widespread throughout the world, it thrives in all oceans and seas, with the exception of the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, a little too cold for it. The Monterey Bay Aquarium remotely operated underwater vehicles have only sighted the beast 27 times in 27 years. Dude, what's with all the matching numbers? Is this a CIA run? A study conducted by the Journal of the Marine Biological Association of the UK revealed info regarding the species and had this to say. The Gigantia is thought to be one of the largest invertebrate predators on this planet. Planet. One more time, please. The largest predator. It is commonly found in the ocean's midnight zone, reaching depths of about 7,000 meters. Deepest human free dive is about 300 meters. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're good. Unless you have a wide lung span. The largest predators in the deep sea, the giant phantom jellyfish's typical prey consists of plankton and small fish. The S. gigantia tends to be dominant in locations with a low productivity system, meaning it deters other predators of fish. Like, it likes it quiet. A shy eater, I'd say. However, when this thing is hungry, it battles squids, eels, and even whales. Okay, never mind. Just when I thought this thing was really cute, it fights off whales for food. The first specimen weighing in at 100 pounds was collected in 1899, but it wasn't recognized as its own species until 1959. Imagine this thing chasing you and catching you, tangling you in like 100 feet of netting tentacles so it can just eat you slowly. Does this thing have a consciousness? Like, you can kind of tell if a shark is swimming near or close to you or what it's kind of feeling. This thing just slowly, softly swimming towards you before it ingests you? Way scarier. Like, I'm convinced these landed here. The oceans are way scarier than things on land. We haven't even started to uncover the whole ecosystem yet. Number five, goblin shark. Under the sea is where nature starts to really let its creative juices flow. It's just an abstract world of tentacles, feelers, and razor sharp teeth down there. Like a Jackson Pollock, but for things that'll bite you. I know that little crab said it's better down where it's wetter, but I just don't know if I agree if things like the goblin shark are swimming around freely. I know that sounds kind of like I have a strong opinion about these things, and I do. The goblin shark is probably one of the scariest looking living creatures on the planet. The translucent skin really isn't helping matters. I mean, seriously, Google, try and find a cute photo of one of these things, even a little baby. Every single picture of it makes it look like something H.R. Giger would look at and think, hmm, maybe tone it down a bit. The goblin shark gets its name from its grotesque appearance. Sorry to all our goblin shark viewers, it's nothing personal. It's elongated nose and it's unique unhinged jaws full of nail-like teeth. That nose isn't just for show either. It actually serves as a little prey detector for the goblin shark. The nose is filled with electroreceptors that allow it to pick up tiny electric fields of prey. It sneaks around the seabed using that little food finder to sniff out its next meal. 
electrically charged tracking sharks with monstrous teeth. Wasn't that literally a joke in one of the Austin Powers movies? Goblin sharks actually can't even close their mouths fully with their teeth always being visible just to let you know what they're packing. I think as a general rule of thumb, you should stay away from any creature scientifically named after a goblin. That's advice that has done me well, that's advice that has served Spider-Man well, and I am passing that on to you. Having a good time so far? It would really make my day if you tossed a little old subscribe our way. Number four, the Pacific Black Dragon. Now, this is an entry I could probably include solely on a name basis. You wouldn't even need to see a picture of it, and you just trust that the Pacific Black Dragon is a scary looking fish. However, I'm a visual learner, and you're watching a YouTube video, so we're going to include several pictures of one of Mother Nature's most precious little abhorrent monstrosities. Take a look at this thing. You would be forgiven for thinking that this thing popped out of that one guy's chest in Alien, because it looks way more like a chest burster than it does a fish. And for those keeping track at home, that's my second reference to the 1979 sci-fi classic, and it probably won't be the last in this video. This angry little noodle, occasionally referred to as the Black Sea Dragon, gets its name from the fact that its skin absorbs 99.95% of the light in its habitat, which happens to be anywhere from 1,600,000 feet to 6,000 feet below the depths. Meaning this thing is dark. It hides in plain sight in the pitch black water, letting the bait hanging from its chin attract prey. Smaller fish swim up to what they think is something appetizing, and then the last thing they ever see is two beady little glowing eyes and then nothing. While this little fish is one of the smallest monsters on our list, I don't trust a fish that learned how to fish. There's something traitorous about that behavior. And honestly, maybe it's shallow, but I just can't move on from how truly horrifying this thing looks. I'm vapid, I can admit that. And I would love to see the Megalodon snarf this thing up. Number three, Japanese spider crab. How do spiders manage to get into everything? Doesn't matter where you are, you will find a spider crawling around in your apartment, up your shower, on your walls, on the toilet seat. I thought we would have been safe at least in the ocean, but I really should have known better. Introducing the Japanese spider crab, a creature pulled directly from my nightmares in my therapy sessions. These things look like they crawled out of the dankest depths and can grow up to 12 feet long. They can grow up to be 40 pounds, and if somehow one of its many legs gets severed, they can just regrow those no problem when they molt next. They're not just one of the longest crabs in the world, they also have possibly the longest lifespan of any crab, with a spider crab living to up to 100 years old. You're telling me there's a crabby long legs walking around out there who was born in the 20s, still kicking about on the ocean floor, moving his little bowler hat, spinning his little crabby cane? Now a little bit of cursory digging taught me two things about the spider crab to put my fears on ice. Apparently these monsters, despite their outward appearance, are completely benevolent and are more content to scavenge around the ocean floor looking for scraps than they are ever likely to interact with a human and are actually considered to be quite lazy by crab standards. Apparently they taste amazing and are considered a delicacy in some parts of Japan. I know for me, a key part of exposure therapy and getting over any of my fears is to eat my fears slathered in a buttery reduction, uh, prepared over rice, maybe with a nice soy sauce. I'm looking at more pictures and maybe I was totally wrong about the Japanese spider crab. I'm also very tall in a way that concerns people and I'm very lazy, usually scavenging for my next meal as well. Although I am hoping that my next meal is a spider crab sushi combo. Number two, stargazer. The stargazer is a fish that's got a face only a mother nature could love. And even then, it looks like she might not be that generous. This thing kind of looks like if you buried a pug up to its face and then left it out in the sun for a few months. I don't think it's even too much of a stretch to say this might very well be the ugliest fish on the planet. Now, it's not a crime to be the ugliest fish on the planet, and you certainly wouldn't make a list of terrifying creatures just for being a little bit ugly. The stargazer earned its place on this list for also being one of the meanest fishes out there. Oh, it's always the ones you least expect. The stargazer has defensive capabilities that make it sound a lot more like it's a Pokemon than a fish. These things will bury themselves in the ocean floor, turning themselves into a little trap and then using their massive mouths as a vacuum and sucking their unsuspecting prey right up. And if that wasn't enough of an evolutionary selling point for you, the stargazer also has electric organs at the top of it, which transmit electric shocks to predators. That's a nasty little guy. And the name stargazer comes from the fact that when it's burrowing, it buries itself down, and the only thing peering out is its ugly little eyes peering upwards at the sky or the stars. 
I gotta say, I got absolutely no love for these things. I like that they're very ugly, that's charming, but the rest of it, no. They're like scaly little zappy landmines. Number one, Portuguese Man of War. Of all the things on this list, the Portuguese Man of War seems like it's the most not from this planet. It looks beautifully ethereal, like something you'd see floating around in the background in a Star Wars planet or maybe hanging out with the blue things from Avatar. It's a truly cosmic looking wonder of nature. However, it is anything but. The first clue should be the fact that it is named after a 17th century battleship. It looks a bit like a jellyfish, but in actuality, it's a strange little colonial organism made up of smaller organisms called zooids. See, th this already sounds like I'm talking about an alien, a zooid. You gonna look me in the eyes and tell me a zooid is real? This thing actually isn't even an animal per se, but three organisms in a trench coat trying to sneak into the movies. The main zooid is a gas-filled translucent sac, which coincidentally is uh, what my 10th grade gym teacher used to call me to motivate me to run around the track faster. The gas-filled sac allows the colony to float. The man of war has no means of movement, instead having to rely on the currents of the ocean to direct it around. Real go with the flow type of organism. Not a bad attitude, to be honest. Now the next zooid, oh, <laughs> I am never gonna get used to saying that are the tentacles, which are really the star of the show here. The tentacles on a man of war reach lengths of up to 165 feet. Now I'll run that by you in case you heard that, fainted and didn't quite catch what I said. Get up off the floor. Their tentacles can get up to 165 feet long. That's really long. The tentacles, which mind you, carry a sting like a jellyfish's. It's been known to cause paralysis, is enough to kill a fish, and has been on some occasions enough to be lethal to humans. One Redditor recounts a painful story of a vacation to Cuba, strolling a beach and seeing what they thought was a plastic bag floating in the water. They then went to pick it up and as they described, the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital in a vinegar bath with a morphine drip, a team of doctors extracting the tentacles that were stuck into my hand. That's enough to keep me away from the water for a bit and maybe uh, prevent myself from ever doing a good deed, try to pick up some litter. I feel like even the Megalodon might want to be careful around this strange monster.